few years ago, on my way to uh, record programs in Alabama, passing through Birmingham, I uh, taped a uh, program in the other Birmingham, in England. I, I live in Midtown, New York, but I was obliged to get around to these places for various reasons, and it was, I suppose, a coincidence that the two places I was broadcasting in had the same name, and I, I believe I may still be the only uh, priest ever to have uh, televised from the two Birminghams within the space of a few days. But the reason I was in that other Birmingham was that John Henry Newman spent much of his Catholic life there and died there. He called it Birmingham. When I came back here, I was passing through Atlanta Airport, uh, one of the people there corrected my pronunciation. Down here, it's Birmingham. But John Henry Newman lived and died in Birmingham. It was on another visit to uh, the southern part of the United States that I was reminded of how alive that life still is, how vivid a Newman's presence remains in the church. For at the end of a lecture, a woman came up to me and remarked that since I had mentioned the name Newman in my talk, I might be interested to know that her father had been a schoolboy at the Birmingham Oratory School. This uh, school was founded by uh, John Henry Newman as a uh, ministry of the Oratory of St. Philip Neri, the English branch of which he was the founder. Newman was born in 1801. He died in 1890. He was a young scholar in the University of Oxford and became vicar of the University Church of St. Mary the Virgin there. As a young clergyman of the Church of England, he preached from that pulpit Sunday after a Sunday, sermons now collected as the parochial and plain sermons, which are literary classics as well as theological classics, and they are valid for the Catholic reader, although they were written before the hand of God led him down paths at that time he could not foresee to the Church of Rome. In fact, if you had told him in those years, those early 1830s, that someday he would be a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church, he would have frozen with embarrassment and horror, for he made a trip to Rome as a young Anglican. And while he was fascinated with some of the things he saw, he was horrified with others. He said, Rome is corrupt and indecent. On that trip, he was accompanied by a friend of his, Harold Froude, and Froude's father. While they were in Sicily, in a village called Castro Giovanni, Newman came down with a fever, which lasted some three weeks. He was in and out of consciousness, and all the while the light seemed to him, as it does with any feverish patient, too bright to tolerate, garish. And yet whenever he seemed to be coming out of his comatose state, he would repeat over and over, I have not sinned against the light. And the light of which he spoke was not the light shining from the sun over Castro Giovanni. 
He had served the light of the world as best as he could according to his own lights for several years from the pulpit of that university church. Now the hand of God was upon him in ways that he could not himself divine. Froude and his father went off uh, on the rest of their journey, uh, leaving uh, Newman to complete his trip back to England on an orange freighter, a fruit-carrying ship. In the Straits of Bonifacio, between Corsica and Sardinia, the boat became becalmed for three weeks. He passed some of his time writing poetry. I think that if we count Ambrose as a hymn-writing doctor of the church and Aquinas the same, there may be a day when we will be able to say that John Henry Newman is both a hymn-writer and a doctor of the Holy Catholic Church. All he thought of doing was passing the time on that boat. When I became most qualmish, he said, I passed my time writing verse. And of the 80 verses he wrote, some constitute a poem he called first the Pillar of the Cloud. And that poem he wrote all in one day. This is Ju uh, June 16, 1833. We know it better by its opening line. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. And then with a maturity beyond his young years, he speaks almost as an ancient. I was not ever thus, nor prayed that thou shouldst lead me on. I, I love to choose and see my path, but now lead thou me on. I loved the garish day, and spite of fears, pride ruled my will. Remember not past years. So long thy power hath blessed me, sure it still will lead me on, or moor and fen, or crag and torrent, till the night is gone. And with the morn those angel faces smile, which I have loved long since and lost a while. The pillar of the cloud that he had in mind, of course, was the pillar that led Moses and the Jews through the wilderness to the Promised Land. God, remember, led them by a pillar of cloud at day and a pillar of fire at night. So would the Holy Spirit lead Newman through his spiritual wilderness, which he found quite comfortable in externals, to a promised land which he could not yet imagine. A few weeks after he uh, returned to the university in Oxford, his friend, another clergyman, John Keeble, also a poet and hymn writer, preached a famous sermon to a group of judges in that university church of which Newman was vicar. This was July 14, 1833. Newman always held that moment as the launching of what is called the Oxford Movement. And that confluence of spiritual leaders, theologians, ordinary parish clergymen, lay people, to a fuller understanding of Catholicism eventually led to a vast conversion of some of the most distinguished lights of his day. All the while, he kept repeating, 
I have not sinned against the light. Newman wanted to be honest before God. He would not live a lie, he would not preach a lie, and it still took him some years, some dozen more years, before in conscience he could accept the claims of the one holy Catholic, apostolic, and Roman fact. Those lines he wrote on that orange boat were put away in the drawer. It had appeared in one or two magazines, but Newman basically forgot it. But other people read it and remembered it. There was a Church of England clergyman long after Newman's conversion, 1865, John Bacchus Dykes, who came very close to becoming a Catholic himself. He loved music. He was very much taken with Catholic doctrine. He was a relatively leading voice in his own diocese. In fact, he trained singing voices in Durham Cathedral as precentor. His increasingly pro-Catholic theology very much annoyed his bishop, and they had a very stormy relationship. Perhaps it was to, mm, in a pious way, antagonize his more Protestant bishop of Durham that Dykes set Newman's hymn to music. And what music? He himself says that he was walking through London along the Strand. August 29, 1865, and he heard a young fellow walking past him whistling a tune. probably sounded more like this. Bacchus went back to Durham and wrote. kindly light, amid the encircling gloom, lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home, lead thou me on. And as Dykes was writing that hymn, the music, the words had already been fulfilled in the life of John Henry Newman, living up there in Birmingham. Newman loved music himself. He was a violinist. Some years, considerable years, after becoming a Catholic, a friend of his from the old days, Dean Church, that Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, Church of England, presented him with uh, the gift of a violin, a fiddle, as Newman always called it. And although Newman's fingers were somewhat arthritic, he wrote to Church, what great delight I had in trying my new fiddle. I seemed to play it all the night. This I cite as an example of a special gift that Newman had given to him, a refinement of some natural virtue, the gift for honest, philia, friendship. For as long as his friends were willing still to talk to them, he cherished them. And even those who did walk away, he remembered. But throughout his life, 
he kept those friends in mind, and as they died, he kept their pictures uh, with him. In the 1920s, an English scholar, a scholar of English literature, Professor Joseph Riley, uh, dissected this hymn and thought it quite inferior. He said it was filled with contradictory images and the like. Well, if we take poetry literally, any good poem will seem filled with contradictory and even implausible images. Perhaps the strangest of all the images Newman uses is this at the end. So long thy power hath blessed me, still it, sure it will, it will lead me on. Or more and fen, or crag and torrent, till the night is gone. And with the morn, those angel faces smile, which I have loved long since and lost a while. What are these angel faces? Well, I've been to his little room in Birmingham, and I've seen his desk where he wrote, the little closet that has his cardinal's robes and his old academic hood from his university days, which he did not think contradicted the scarlet of the cardinal's robes. For nothing he had ever written or taught as a young scholar was written without a desire to be faithful to the light. Around the altar, the little altar in that room, are the pictures of his friends. When people die, they don't become angels. Angels are angels and men are men. Each has his glory. But for Newman, speaking poetically, all his friends, many of whom he had also helped usher into the fullness of the light, were angelic to him. Uh, this is something we have to remember when people distort the gift of friendship, when they tell us that there's only one kind of love, and that love itself is an illusion. And it is also something we have to remember when we are told that the light of God is an illusion, and that we have to choose between loyalties to our friends and loyalty to God. Newman knew there was no contradiction. He knew that there would be sacrifices to make in order to be faithful to the light, but he would never, never sin against that light. It was pride that had ruled his will as he saw it, and by comparison with us, that pride was not very sinful. Newman was conspicuous for his humility, but as with all the Holy Ones, he seemed to think that his pride was worse than that of anyone. And why? Because he had seen the glory of God, and because he knew how little he was and how fragmented all our attempts to shed light on mm, truth are, compared to the unity and the brightness and the glory of God. He says, I was not ever thus, nor prayed that thou shouldst lead me on. I love to choose and see my path, but now lead thou me on. 
He prayed that day in and day out. And every time he prayed that, he kept in his mind's vision the fact that Christ is the light of the world. As God showed himself to the prophets of old and the patriarchs of the Jews in signs and wonders through the pillar of the cloud, through the pillar of fire, so there came a time when the light of the world came into the world himself. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never overcome it. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He said, no one lights a candle and puts it under a bushel, but rather puts it on a candle stand so that it may give light to the whole house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The earliest recollection of Newman's great mind, one of the greatest minds that God has ever given to civilization, was as a child of about four when his mother placed in the window of their house in the village of Ham a candle to celebrate Lord Nelson's victory at the Battle of Trafalgar. And to Newman, that candle represented childhood with all its pleasures and fond recollections of home and hearth. But the older he grew, the more that candle represented to him his Lord, who enlightens all minds who turn to him. Newman wrote his own memorial inscription. It's on a tablet on a wall as you go to the uh, oratory cemetery where he is buried. Ex umbris et imaginibus in veritatem. Out of the shadows and illusions to the truth. Newman wrote that epitaph because he lived it. And when, as a young man, he wrote this hymn, this pillar of the cloud, this lead kindly light on that boat, he had no idea, really, of the portent of those words himself. He had no expectation that we would be talking about these words now or playing them poorly. But what he said came true. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. One step, day by day. Remember that old Latin saying, age codages, do what you're doing. One step a day. Just do God's work his way and be faithful to the light. That's all that Newman had to do uh, for this prophetic hymn to be fulfilled in his own life. And it's all we have to do for it to be fulfilled in our lives as well. No one, no one of any sense, lights a candle and puts it under a bushel. That is false humility. The humble soul recognizes the light of God and how that light has shone in the saint's soul and lets that light be shown. Whatever the talent is, whatever the gift is, whatever the virtue is, whatever the vice overcome, whatever the spiritual struggle, all these things are to be shown to the glory of God. 
That's what Newman did. And he lit a candle in his day that still burns and by all evidence seems to be growing brighter and brighter. He had preached as a Catholic that there would be a second springtime in his own land. This rebirth of the faith would recover the shrines, would enlighten the homes that had grown orphaned from the faith and would fill the land again with saints. Newman lit a candle by the grace of God and all we can do is admire what a bright light it still is.